Well, Alex, it's that time again. It is? It is. It's time for us to do another vlog. All because right. heaven forbid, uh, we just barely got out of the theater to see another movie, and uh, we need to actually vlog about it. Yeah, imagine that. Even though people wanted us to see so many more movies up until this point. But this is where we, we come back in, and uh, our subject material is already... This is one of those things where I wish our camera was up and running, but unfortunately it isn't. So you guys will have to deal with the audio. But uh, yeah, this is one of those times where I wish it was so you guys could see the frustration in my eyes and you could see the uh, absolute just resigned look that Alex has over what we just watched. <laughs> As we delve into the the 2018 reboot at least of the film franchise of Tomb Raider. Tomb Raider. Tomb Raider. So really quick before we get into best and worst and all that, let's let's go into history a little bit. And again, if your brand's making new, we are going to spoil the ever living crap out of this. So if you want to see this movie, go see it and then check out our opinions on it. Yep. Uh, so first of all, I think we've pretty much covered this a lot on Track and Shadow. The original PlayStation games, neither one, neither one of us played. Right. Um, I'm, I was aware of them, but I literally looked at them, scoffed at them and, and never wanted to play them, uh, simply because chick with big boobs is not necessarily something that's going to bring me into a game franchise. I know that's shocking to people, but I literally looked at that and said, oh, well then that, that just tells me there's not a whole lot to it. So I never played the games, uh, not until the 2013 reboot, which is what I think is a lot better, a lot more better constructed story. The Angelina Jolie films. Now, you've seen people review it, but yeah. you haven't seen them. I've never not seen even, them. Not even on TNT. I'm, well, you know, I'm sure I've seen them a little bit on TV, but I don't think I've ever sat down to actually watch it, even when it's on TV. <laughs> I, yeah, I just don't think I've ever yeah, and, sat and frankly, really I don't, paid I, attention. I don't even think you would have been motivated because you never played the original PlayStation games. Yeah, I never played Tomb Raider, so. So at that point, like, you probably would have just looked at it and went, oh, action film with Angelina Jolie in it. I unfortunately have seen both films uh, after being dragged various for various reasons to those films. And I'm here to tell you, I didn't like either of them. I at least think that the I agree with the nostalgia critic and he just barely put out a review that the first one can be enjoyable if you check your brain at the door. Right. If you don't actually take into the fact that this is supposed to be like an Indiana Jones ripoff and we're supposed to, you know, be able to put the pieces together. If you could take all of that out of there and just check your brain at the door, you can enjoy it. Two, not not so much. Uh, I, I can honestly say like both movies were very unenjoyable to me unless I was able to check my brain at the door and then the first one's somewhat enjoyable. But yeah, then the reboot happened in 2013. Me and Andrea have done a let's play of the rebooted Tomb Raider, which we loved. Yeah, and then um, I joined you for rice. What was that? And then I joined you for Rise of the Tomb Raider. Yeah, we did. We, we did our, one of our first gaming with the geeks was with you on Rise of the Tomb Raider because it didn't make sense to bring it over to Dragon Shadow when we didn't have the first game there, too. Um, but yeah, you joined us for Rise. You enjoyed yourself. Yeah, out of it was it. a fun, fun ride. And so there you go. There's our history for it. And and I guess just to throw that in our Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Are we both excited? Yeah. yeah. I, I got to say I am. I have a feeling. And from from talking to people who actually you know, I have friends who did play the original PlayStation games. A lot of us kind of had the same theory that they're hinting at the fact this might tell the original Tomb Raider story. Um, so at that point, it's not necessarily prequels anymore. It's getting Lara up to where she was. Mm -hmm. So that might be interesting. But you guys are here for this damn movie. Yeah. So. Oh, this is actually going to be really difficult, but let's go into what we thought was good about this movie. OK. And uh, I'm going to let you start because because you kind of walked in with zero expectations here. I kind of did, too. But as soon as they started unraveling stuff, I had some problems. So what what was good about this film, you think? I think the, the uh, do we what's her name? They found the person they found Alicia the Vikander. I think the, is how you Alicia say Vikander. She was really good. I thought I liked her as Lara Croft as good as you can expect for a different person to play the role. I mean, because um, I, I really enjoy, I mean, I enjoyed the person who played laura in rise of the tomb raider yeah and her, enjoyed... her voice is escaping me right now yeah. but she's really good yeah because i enjoyed her too and so for this movie version they got a really good person i think to really play her and i think so glad they kind of stuck with the british character here because 
I don't think Angelina Jolie even so much as bothered to try to pretend. Apparently to be there was talk about getting an Easter egg with Angelina Jolie in it, and that fell through. Mm, That's okay. the most that I know. Oh well. So <coughs> so yeah, so at least they're trying a little bit here to yeah. be a, a little true to the character. She's got the look. I think she definitely got the physical prowess down. I'm sure she worked out. I'm sure she Oh, trained and somebody for did it. actually tell me, and I, I think this is accurate. Uh, at the very end, and again, we're going spoilers, guys. I'm not, we're, we're not, yeah, spoilers. We're not uh, beating around the bush here. The the guns that she gets at the store, I think, are the same props from the first movie. I'm not a hundred percent on that one, though. Right. Okay. So, so acting wise, solid lead with Alicia. So really decent casting all around. I mean, we got Matthias in this, and. He was really good too, and pretty menacing. So, uh, Walton Goggins. Walton Goggins, yeah. Uh, kindly, rich. Uh, Sorry, Richard we're trying Croft. very hard to acknowledge the actors because we we have issues doing that. Yeah, uh, it's hard to remember names off the top of your head. You know, especially especially the ones that I know I've seen in like twelve other movies. But then it's just like I know that face, I just don't know the name. Yeah, uh, great performance for Richard Croft's character. Great uh, from Dominic West. Dominic West. Uh, the cap, the ship boat captain, Mister what is his name? Uh, it was Lou. It was Lou Ren. Yeah, uh, Lou Ren. The actor's name is Daniel Wu. Daniel Wu. So solid casting all around, I think. And the action pieces are really good, really great. I think exciting action pieces, especially from the start. We do, and I think we also they do a pretty good job of trying to build a bit of character for Lara Croft. Okay, from the start they. They do try to make her, they try to make her into a character first before they start making her to an action. Granted, we start with some action scenes, but, <clears throat> but it's built to, I feel like the action, the exciting, you know, Tomb Raider action set pieces are built to, right? And mm. we, that's the thing, I think this thing also does well is they build every, to everything very well. Sometimes the payoff is stupid. We'll get to that. Yeah. But everything is really built to pretty well, right? So we see at the start of the movie, we see, okay, she she boxes. She probably does MMA. So she has some fighting oh, skills. Oh, yeah, that was straight MMA. Uh, that was straight MMA. Yeah. So she's got some fighting skills. And I actually think somebody was like pointing out to me that the person she was going up against was a legit U UFC fighter. Oh, cool. I did not know who, though. Yeah. I, we don't follow MMA. Uh, so. oh, well, I kind of do, but it's just because I do a wrestling podcast. Yeah. And, and you have some people who kind of go from MMA to, to wrestling a lot. But yeah, yeah I, I don't know who she was. Like, I only know a few names. Yeah. So I think they do a good job trying to, like, sow the seeds and plant things and then pay them off later, which is something I think a lot of writers, excuse me, struggle with is trying to properly plant your story elements so that they pay off later. It's not just like, oh, she's instantly a natural with a bow and arrow we see her as a little kid that she practiced at in archery and we do so we get that we see that she's got some fighting skills because she boxes and does mma we see she's uh clever because she tries to do this weird little foxtail race and you'd see the movie i don't want to explain it so yeah um so, and she finds basically it's a plot line that i'm kind of surprised hasn't made its way into a michael bay movie for how dumb it is and, and how much parkour it actually entails. Yeah, I was fine. I was fine with that because it. Oh, no, I'm not saying it's it's necessarily a bad thing, but I'm just like, wow, this this should be in a Michael Bay movie. <laughs> this makes more sense in a Michael Bay movie. Um, What else? Yeah, that's I think that's it for me. I think. Okay. So, yeah, again, overall, just good casting, uh, some decent story plots that are planted and built off later. Yeah. The execution on the other hand is a different story, but at least that they're planted that I can appreciate. I think you and I can both agree on a lot of stuff. And, and this is going to come through in, in this vlog is um, a lot of the ideas that they tried to do here looked great on paper, but kind of flopped on execution. Yeah. And so at that point there, and, and we'll get into that, but uh, my likes of the film were, I did like a lot of the cinematography. I thought they set scenes pretty damn well, especially when they get to the island and you have some really good shots. Granted, a lot of them are probably CG based, like the rusty plane. And um, but again, the rusty plane makes sense. This this 
I, I honestly didn't think that was too much of a fish out of a water kind of thing because spoiler alert, this game or this movie tries to emulate the first, the 2013 reboot game. Yeah. And so in a lot of cases where, you know, you, since I know the surrounding that I'm in, seeing a rusty old World War II plane makes sense for it to be there. And it makes sense for putting the slightest bit of weight on that thing. It's going to just start crumbling kind of thing. So I did like how they set that scene. I also felt like a lot of the set design was pretty, pretty well done and, and pretty well uh, executed. I did like the feel of that gym. It felt like a, a dingy hole in the ground, which is what, you know, what most from what I've been told, most British gyms are going to feel like. I'm sure that was like a real gym that they found and shot at. Yeah, exa- but but I'm saying the shots that they did out of it just just accentuated that. Yeah. Um, I will also say that the set designs for the tomb itself were well done. Mm-hmm. I, I did like that whole concept. And I, I do agree with you on the concept that when um, when you don't know something's coming. This film does a really great job of building the tension. Yeah. Okay, so like the the one example that I'm going to give is. um, The when she goes to visit her father's tomb and all of a sudden she opens the door like you don't know what's going to happen. And all of a sudden you see like stuff moving below. You almost wonder if like some kind of security measure is going to come out and shoot her kind of thing. And all, all of it, do, all of a sudden it just opens up the bat cave. Kind yeah. of thing. I, I liked I like the tension that they tried to do with a lot of this stuff. Um. I also liked how they tried to paint uh, Lara's intellectual prowess, which I'm just going to go ahead and spoil right here is actually something I don't like about it because I feel this film emphasizes too much her physical prowess. And the first game is more is more boosting her intellectual prowess and, and the fact that she's very, very smart and this movie doesn't have too many moments where they can accentuate that. Yeah. But when it does, it, when it, when she has like a puzzle in front of her, it's really cool to see her work the wheels, so to speak. Um, that Again, the, the physical prowess is a problem of mine, and it's just because one of the reasons that the original game or the original game script worked was that she was such an intellectual putting her into a dire situation on an, an a de- on a deserted island was unthinkable it it was like literally just it it was signing her death warrant and so she slowly over the game has to become uh this person you know the the tagline of the 2013 reboot was a legend is born and the reason being is like she has to become that hardened person uh so i didn't like the the, while i do think some of those scenes were really well done accentuating her physical prowess over her her mental one i think was a misstep in this regard because that's that's the lara that we want to know that's the lara that that we will come to know and love out of it instead uh i'm not saying that the personalities harm too much but it's it's more of a she's got a punkish feel to her a not a not not necessarily a reckless scientist kind of feel to her i especially loved when walton goggins called her reckless i'm just like what what actions has she taken in this movie up to this point that have pointed out to be reckless aside from going to a remote deserted island that she didn't know there were storms all around yeah you know uh so yeah there those are the best let's let's get into the worst here guys cuz uh, uh well first of all cuz we kind of skipped this one but final assessment what what did you think of it like was it good was it bad i'd say it was well i was in the middle for it so it was okay. Uh, yeah. For you. See, we'll, we'll get this when we start getting into our ads here, but I was really digging the movie for the first half, good half hour, good first hour, because I'm not super familiar with the games beyond Rise of Tomb Raider here, yep. so I'm not married to the original storylines or anything. It's just more like, okay, am I going to be enjoying myself? And I was. I was enjoying myself. I was liking what we were seeing with Laura. I liked yeah. a lot of the setups. I liked a lot of the set pieces and the action pieces that were set early on. Then, uh, should we just jump into bad now? Yeah, let's yeah. go. Let's go. So, so my viewpoint is, is I, I thought it was okay as well. Yeah, okay, bordering on bad because uh, when you're a fan, this is gonna this is gonna hurt a lot more than if you're just walking into it. Yeah. So, and that when the movie the movie starts falling apart for me. Is, and I'm sure you and I were both gonna agree here. Is right. Oh no, we both we both flipped out in the theater. Yeah, it's right. What it, she's finally landed on the island. She's she broke away from 
from Trinity because yeah, Trinity's in this movie. Yeah, misstep number one, and and of course, so she finds this crazy old hermit, which you would swear is Luke Skywalker all over again. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out, oh, it's her dad. Hey, yeah. So, uh, spoiler alert: misstep. This has got to be misstep number one, as far as I'm concerned, because yeah. it's the biggest misstep of the damn film. Richard Croft is alive. Yeah, he's alive through the course of this movie and he does die at the end, which is still dumb, but it, it was so dumb. It's like this director literally looked at it and went, nobody will feel the pain of death without actually experiencing it. Fuck you. Fuck you. I don't blame the director. I blame their screenwriters here. Yeah. yeah okay. You point point made. Fuck you writers. Because the bottom line is, is like 80% of what makes Lara strong and, and any Tomb Raider fan, whether you be older or brand spanking new from the reboots, will agree on is that one of the things that makes Lara strong is the loss of her father. Yeah. And the fact that she, through doing Tomb Raiding, through trying to solve puzzles, she becomes closer to her dad by doing so. Yeah. And I know people are going to say, well, of course, the, what it reminded me of was it really reminded me of last crusade yeah and i know i'd get it tomb raider and uncharted two different wouldn't franchises been, wouldn't have been funny sorry random add moment but wouldn't it have been funny to have that uh last crusade moment of she talks in a sleep <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> with a father and a daughter it's just like how did you know that he was evil she uh, actually i wanted to be a woman it's like should have been anna <laughs> something like that yeah it should have been like uh she talks in her sleep and then and then the dad just like i didn't trust Laura. Laura, <laughs> that's not very ladylike. I'm not a lady, father. <laughs> uh, uh, so it, it really reminded me, it felt like they were trying to do Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And I know Tomb Raider already takes a lot from Indiana Jones. That's fine. You know, but there's when, a when you originally brought that up to me, I wasn't agreeing with you. And then we saw the end of the movie and now I'm there with you. <laughs> but, you know, it kind of reminds me. It's just like it's the very shortened version of Last Crusade. Yeah. Because, okay, uh, Indy finds his father's materials and uh, he decides to go looking for him or go looking for the grail or something. And uh, mostly for him, mostly for Henry. But, and of course. Well, yeah, he starts the journey for his dad, but then ultimately, you know, the dad gets, joins the journey and now Indy's doing it for himself. Yeah. That's really what it reminded me of. And. I was just like, come on, guys. I know Tomb Raider's borrows a bit from Indiana Jones, but yeah, Uncharted but, and Tomb Raider do. But now you're just outright stealing from Indiana Jones. I, it's it's the difference between being like a star. I would actually say they didn't really steal because I still feel moments in Last Crusade are more impactful. Oh, don't get than me wrong. This. Don't get me wrong. It is. <laughs> That's why I'm saying this is like. The abridged version of Last Crusade. Because I, I will say right here and now, the moment where where uh, Sean Connery's dying, I, I honestly felt more emotion out of that than when you find out that basically Richard has been sentenced to death. Roughly. Yeah. Like, you don't even... I literally walked through that scene and I'm just like, hmm. Because for all intents and purposes, he was already dead. Yeah, pretty much. You know, and it's like you're already used to this stuff and therefore the 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 impact of his death is meaningless because you already thought he was dead. Yeah. And it, it also kind of undercuts Laura's own survival ability here because I don't want to, this whole movie undercuts her survivability, but okay. I mean, it's just, it was so unnecessary to bring the, to have the dad really be alive all this time. Yeah. And I, that was when I checked out and that was when I was just done. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. One more positive here. The story of Queen Himiko was a pretty interesting legend, and I, I was really worried there were you. You, I heard you too, muttering. It's like it's going to be CGI ghosts, isn't it? It's going to be CGI ghosts. Yes, I actually thought that was going to happen, and I'm just like, yes. if it's CGI ghosts, I'm walking the fuck out. They didn't do CGI ghost. No CGI ghost. No sky portal. No mummy slash Cause they, enchantress. Because here's the thing: is like they they. I actually liked kind of the twist that they did with the Himiko storyline. I'm still going to say the reboot was better, uh, but I did like what they tried to do here. And that'll go into my negatives because we'll, we'll get there. But yeah. I, I did like what they tried to do with Himiko here instead of what they did with the reboot. But unfortunately, that kind of falls short as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I liked it because, uh, you know, I don't think I really expected Supernatural in this 
I don't know. I can't. It's been a while now, and I can't quite remember. Were, were there the supernatural elements in Rise? Or yes. Was, okay. Yes, because yeah. you had the immortal ones. Oh yeah. Okay. Or so. the the de- not the immortal ones, the deathless ones. Okay. Is what they were called. So yeah. All right. It wouldn't be out of place for this franchise, but it wasn't what I was expecting. But but, but also look back into so first two first two Tomb Raider reboots have super, supernatural elements. Right. First two Uncharted games have uh, supernatural elements. Yeah. So okay, it's not out of place. No, it's just, but yeah, I was, in wor- fact, it, we were worried it was going to be, in you fact, know, Enchantress 3.0 here, Enchantress or Mummy from the reboot Mummy. Cause that, oh yeah, I guess you could call it the, see for me, I, I'm just going Mummy. So that that's yeah. me, but okay. Yeah. So, but I'm really glad they didn't do that. They averted that. No sky portals <laughs> as Andre the Black Nerd will surely praise. No sky portals. Well, negatives. As I said, my biggest, biggest negative here was just the fact that Richard Croft was still alive because I think it just cheapened it everything. Takes such power away from from both him as well as Lara. Yeah. W- through him being alive. And just makes for a really half assed Last Crusade plot. Uh, yeah. And again, I'd say Last Crusade was better. That's what I'm saying. It's um, half-assed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like if you're gonna, I wouldn't even say half-assed. I'd say phoned in because <laughs> it's like it's it's like in between half-assed. Phoned in is usually half-assed, but whatever. Yeah, that too. Yeah. Um. So my <laughs> negatives. Oh, may I count them? There's going to be a list. Okay. So again, I've played the reboot, and this is strongly trying to tell the story of the reboot as well as add in elements from Rise of the Tomb Raider to create an overarching story. Okay. And it fucks up in all of those regards. Yes, I know I'm cursing a lot, guys, but this is this is legitimately pissed me off. Misstep number one, Richard Croft being alive. Um, that you guys don't even realize how much power you take out of the Lara character with her being, uh, with him being alive. And I, the, the worst part about it is I even told you after the theater, I think I even told you in the theater, I knew how to fix that. Yeah. I knew how to make that work is because substitute any character. Well, we'll get there, but, uh, and this goes into one of my other missteps. The crew of the endurance is missing. It, they are, they're not even in the damn movie. And that's such a fucking shame because a lot of them were really cool characters to have Lara bounce off of. And I'll just be personally, personally honest. It would have been really great to have Nigel Thornberry die a horrible, horrific Himiko death in this movie. I would be so happy if it happened. It's not Tim Curry, guys. <laughs> he keeps making this Nigel Thorne. No, I, I call him. I don't remember his actual name. I think it's. I think it's Harry. But he <laughs> he's got like the big Nigel Thornberry mustache, and he actually like he's so pompous that in the playthrough that me and Andrea did, we called him Nigel, Nigel Thornberry. Nigel Thornberry. <laughs> because it made sense. It, like, dude, he he literally ratted them out like four times in that entire movie. In that, he's basically, you've seen the Ben Frazier mummy or the Brendan Frazier yes, mummy. Yes, yeah. So you know Benny? Yeah. He's Benny. Okay. <laughs> like, he's the guy that you want to see get, you know, impaled on a spike kind yeah. of thing. Um, so yeah, the crew of the endurance was missing and, and you missed out on a lot of ones. And one of one in particular could have fixed the dad issue and that would have been Rost. Um, so for those who have played the original one, uh, Rost is basically like a best friend to Richard Croft has gone on previous adventures with him. And after Lord Richard's passing, he actually joins Lara on this journey to find Yamatai because he simply believes in her. He he has so much faith in the Croft family that he's willing to go to hell and high water for all of them. And it would have been a cool thing instead of having Richard be the crazy old hermit on the island, instead having Rost be the hermit. Absolutely. And instead being able to say, you know, like instead of having the dad go, you know, I, I, I love you and all that stuff. It would have been better to have him go. Look, I've gone through thick and thin with a Croft. I know what you guys are capable of. You're smart, Lara. You can kick ass, Lara. It would have been so much better to have fucking Rost in this movie um, instead of her dad. And so at that point, you miss on so much power you could have given Lara through through sheer storytelling by not having Rost and instead having Richard Croft and having him being kind of a pansy ass. Yeah. Just curious, would you... Uh, he was the pansy ass Laura was supposed to be in this movie. Yeah. Would you uh, would you have liked him if it had been that character instead of Richard? Would you like would you have wanted him to say survive or sacrifice himself the way Richard does in the end by 
blow in the tomb. He and I mean, he in essence in the first game takes a bullet for Lara. Okay. So at that Does point, like, yeah. Okay. Like, well, he he takes a couple. Actually, now that I think about it, he takes like a couple of bullets for Lara. Wow. And like he survives one of them, gets a broken leg and all that stuff. And then and then eventually, you know, he he takes an axe to the back or something like that. And he does die. And, and his messages to her are, look, the situation is dire, but you're a Croft. You will survive. I know you will. Yeah. And in fact, like when when she's trying to convince the crew of the endurance, like to go into the devil's triangle, which is like a death sentence to any sailor. You know, he's just sitting there going, I trust Lara. Fuck all you guys. We're going to go yeah. kind of thing that that's the character that Ross is. That's why I'm saying it would have been so much fucking better if Ross had been the guy instead of Richard. And you missed an opportunity there. And I'm I will forever pissed at this movie for doing it. Who would you like to have seen play Ross? Actually, Dominic West, I think would have been fine. Mm-hmm. I honestly think Dominic, if they just rewritten Richard to be Ross, I would have been fine with it. OK. Um, I can't think of any other actor off the top of my head to play Rost, but that would have been the way to fix it. But the other thing that you miss out on that is, first of all, Laura went to Yamatai with her best friend, Sam. Yeah. And through some stupid fluke, she actually was related to Himiko. Like that, that there's silliness in Tomb Raider that, that's still enjoyable. But I mean, her best friend went with her, uh, Jonah, who, you know, from Rise of the Tomb Raider. Right. He was there on Yamatai with her. He's kind of the spiritual friend. He was the guy that was saying, like, you've got the you've got the gonads, girl. You just have to reach in and find your your inner spirit animal kind mm-hmm. of thing. Mm-hmm. And he would have been great to have here. It would have also been great to have had Reyes. But the problem is, if you had Reyes, you'd have to have Ross because her and Ross were involved. Um, and in fact, I like the fact that Reyes is not in Rise of the Tomb Raider because she's pissed at Lara because she blames Lara for Ross's death. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, basically what I'm saying, fault number two, you didn't have the crew of the fucking Endurance. You took all of them together and made Lou Ren. And Lou Ren, I'm sorry, is a piece of paper compared to the others that you had there. Okay? Not saying anything bad about Daniel Wu's performance, but what did he contribute to this story, aside from being... Um, occasionally being Lara's get-out-of-jail-free card? Okay? Yeah, unfortunately that. There, it seemed like there was going to be a lot more with him, but there just wasn't. I yeah. mean, I'm, just, I'm surprised they didn't kill him right away. Fault number three, Matthias being reworked into Trinity and Trinity being in this movie. OK, this is the thing that pisses me off above all else is, first of all, Matthias, when you get to Yamatai, all of the people who are against Lara are basically what we heard in this movie. They're fishermen. They're military guys who got stuck on this island and can't get off. And because they've been there for so long, they've gone a tad crazy. They've gone a tad crazy. And so like there's this murder death cult on the island that is out to kill everybody. And guess who's the leader of it? Matthias. Right. Who's the only smart one amongst them. You know, I'm Matthias. I'm a teacher. That's that's like one of his ways of introducing himself. Um, And he's the crazy cult leader who believes in the legend of Himiko and actually wants to resurrect Kimiko Himiko, um, even though knowing that it would, you know, you'd be, be bringing, you know, a God amongst men into the world again, kind of thing. And so reworking him to just being this guy who's sick of this Island <laughs> and wants to get off. And the only reason that we have that he wants to get off is just that he wants to get off. I don't care that he has two daughters because he certainly doesn't. Um, so the rewriting there missed opportunity and the, the, the sad reality is Walton Goggins. He could have played the original Matthias. I would have been okay with that too. Uh, you know, have him play crazy cult leader. Yeah, absolutely. I'd have no problem with that. I've seen him play crazy before. And then we get into Trinity. So Trinity exists in rise because the whole premise of the 2013 reboot is all of the whole Yamatai incident is Lara's fault. Okay, even though she was right on the money, even though she knew what, um, you know, what treasure may lie in store for them, she didn't really. And that's that's one of the things I like about um, movies like Raiders or games like Uncharted one and two is that how far can science take you before you realize there's shit that can't be explained. Right. Um, Sometimes you actually walk into a tomb only to find out that it was sealed for a good fucking reason. And that's the whole premise of Yamatai 
is that they get there, they can't get off, and the reason they can't get off is because of fucking Himiko, and it's Lara's fault that they're there. Okay? Okay. And through solving all of that stuff and acknowledging that the supernatural exists, that is what spurs her on to stop calling her dad a fucking crackpot in the, in the rebooted game and to research into what he was looking into, the Divine Source, which was also being hunted by Trinity. And this is how she finds out about Trinity, because his notes are littered with Trinity. He knows that they're following him kind of thing. Right. So what they basically tried to do is take that plot line and integrate it into this movie. And they didn't even do it right. They didn't. They didn't even give us a tenth of the importance of how nasty Trinity can possibly be. And part of that is because since it's a shadow organization, you shouldn't see it a lot of the time. And that's what makes Rise work is that all of a sudden you have these mysterious military guys that we know are associated with Trinity, but we don't know if they're higher ups or anything like that. It's still a shadow organization. And they kind of paint Matthias as if he's a high end dude. Why? Because he's been given the secret mission and he has to fulfill it. O only a higher up in Trinity would get that right. I wouldn't think so. Not if they're going to be dumped on a island and God knows I, I where. I see your, your problem there, too. And then the other problem is, is that basically Croft Holdings is Trinity. Is that a thing in the game or is that no, the thing for the movie? Nope, nope, nope. It's not. Trinity was just following him. Trinity was just investing in him. That, that's why he got scared. It's because they slowly started etching into his life right. and he couldn't get them out. And so at this point, you're basically saying that, oh, look, and I hate to even do this because Batman season one from Telltale was amazing. But, oh, look, Martha and Thomas Wayne were evil the entire time. <laughs> God damn it. Just such such bullshit uh that you you wasted the potential of trinity in this aspect of it especially in the fact that we know who anna is and uh, you you just barely mentioned like you knew the name but you didn't know who she was right she she betrays you because she's a member of trinity right so at that point like any tomb raider fan is going to walk in there and go don't trust her laura don't trust her don't trust her and then when you have the realization from laura's perspective of oh i maybe shouldn't have trusted her you think <laughs> Kind of thing. So that that already hurts. And then my fifth point, and I promise I'm going to go off this. Stop going on this tirade because we actually do have people waiting for us right now. Um, is the sheer like while I love the Himiko plot and what they did with it and how they changed it. There's also a lot of stupid <laughs> in the Himiko plot now. So what they basically did was where she's like this elemental witch in in the reboot. She's now a disease carrier. She's she's got yeah. basically a flesh eating bacteria in her system, except she was immune. And so you get these subtle hints as they go through the tomb of, wait, this wasn't just to keep people out. This was also to keep people in. And so it's like, oh, well, what could possibly cause that? And then all of a sudden we see her skin rot away. And a lot of us kind of sit there and go, oh, this is going to be like ghosts coming out kind of thing. And instead they went down the road of, oh, no, she has a disease. Yeah. And this whole tomb was basically meant to keep her in here so that she didn't infect other people. And when we do see this disease in action, it looks pretty nasty. Yeah. Like it immediately uh, like through skin contact. Uh, we don't know if there was stuff in the air or anything like that. Like you brought this up to me after. But like our only evidence here is through skin contact. The first lieutenant of Matthias gets infected and it just starts wreaking havoc on his body kind of thing like you you see him start going through it and it looks pretty nasty the only problem is is that it's now in his cells now it's in his body and so every time that somebody gets infected with it and gets killed it's just like oh great well now it's used to modern bodies now it's it's gonna get airborne and now we're gonna have bigger problems and, and one of the, the bigger problems that i have with it is richard gets infected and then decides well i'm just gonna blow this whole thing straight to hell yeah by using a grenade and some flares and destroying the whole thing. Except you're blowing yourself apart, which means your cells are now in the air. Well, <laughs> which means now everybody's dead. Well, I would think I would think the fire would take the heat and the fire would take care of probably. It. But then you have the other problem of the added shockwave affecting Matthias, who literally just ate Himiko's finger yeah. and is also infected. And so I'm like sitting there going, well, this would actually be really cool if nobody survived. 
because then the plague is kept in. Uh, there's no chance of it getting out. Oh, wait, Lou Ren! He's outside! He's got to get Lara out. And I was literally looking at that and going, well, if this was an actual disease movie, everybody would be dead uh, right now. I don't, I don't think so. Again, because it's a pretty deep tomb. Matthias is dead. He's in a chasm. And the fire would ideally, the heat in the fire would ideally kill off remaining pathogens. Or, well, and, and here's the thing. We're guessing on that one because, yeah. again, this, there's nothing known about this disease. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fictional Hollywood disease 101. Yeah, you can so, kind of make, make your own rules here. So. I'm, I'm but, trying to remember. Was it, it was just based on general pathology knowledge yeah. here. I'm thinking it it would pr and it would also depend on how long it could stay in terms of airborne. I mean, there are diseases that don't last very long outside like a human body. Yeah, but I like literally while they were going through all that stuff, I could literally feel like my dad sitting right next to me and him going those mother effers. If they unsealed it, it doesn't matter because there's going to be so like you have bodies decaying in there, which means it's spreading onto other bones onto other things and we also confirmed there are living creatures in that tomb yeah because there were spiders those spiders can now technically be you know for as nasty as this plague is we can consider them carriers now uh they were all kind of black so at that point is like there are just so many ways that you could justify the virus getting out at yeah. that point but again, a lot problem. of it would just depend on how yeah. the virus works and so on. But so like far. I said, I could, I could just feel my dad just in there going, this is stupid because everything they're doing wrong is not a way to contain a disease. <laughs> and so that's that's where in a lot of cases I see a lot of stupid being done there is like you had a really great idea on paper, but your execution was kind of weird and flawed. Trinity's wanting to become Umbrella now. <laughs> make a bio weapon they might as well be <laughs> they might as well be i, I mean, mean look, at least here i'll give it this at least here it makes sense for for trinity to be a little I'm surprised stupid. like like in rise i'm actually surprised that since they didn't get the divine source they didn't take one of the deathless ones home with them <laughs> i mean here at least makes sense for them to be a little bit stupid compared to alien covenant where these are supposed to be really smart scientists and they're yeah. like oh let's take we're on this alien planet let's take our space helmets off let's touch these foreign plants <laughs> exactly it's just, uh, just so much stupid here so those are my five major reasons why this doesn't work and i honestly feel like you know even though they had some really great ideas with himiko um it probably would have been better overall to just write a story from scratch yeah. Go go after something else. And and then at that point, if you want to have all these elements, you can have them. Yeah, and I'm OK with it, even though I'm not like against the idea of putting any kind of like supernatural elements, even though that's writing the Indiana Jones line a little closer. It's just I'm glad they did not do supernatural Himeko in this case, because then I think it would have just been Enchantress or the Tom Cruise mummy reboot all over again. So. If they want to do it for a future movie, fine. Just be. I'm just glad they didn't do it here, so we didn't get the next Enchantress. Yeah. Um. So there you go. There are some positives. There are some negatives. So let's go ahead and and wrap this up because, like I said, we we've actually got somebody waiting for us. Right. Um. So final final verdict on Rise of the Tomb Raider. I only or a... not Rise of the Tomb Raider. Tomb Raider. <laughs> Well, it was a solid attempt. You lost me about halfway through. Sorry, guys. So I'm going to just give it a six. Um, I, I'm I'm not going to be as kind because like for for a brand spanking new fan. Yeah, six is probably justified. It's a D effort for me as a fan. It is a four. And it's just simply because you you had a lot of really great things to work with and you you squandered pretty much most pretty much most of everything you had. Um, you had elements of Rise of the Tomb Raider as well as the rebooted Tomb Raider, as well as classic Tomb Raider that just weren't utilized properly here. So I'm going to give it a four. I think it's below average. I, I it's, and everything uh, because like when, when we got out, we looked up the director, we looked up the the writers and everything just screams. This is their first attempt. And I mean, here's the season. thing as below average as this movie is for a first attempt, it's not bad. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, you like if if Square Enix was looking to do this and do this right, they should have just brought in the big guys. You know, they should have just put in that extra money or they shouldn't have done this film at all. Well, that's the problem it, because it's a, I, I got a feeling because it's a video game, video game movies are going to have that trouble trying to attract any like real seasoned, quote unquote, professionals. Yeah. As opposed to being able to find people who are still relative unknowns 
who are looking to kind of make their big Hollywood, a big Hollywood movie. I mean, the director's has a few films under his belt, but it's mostly the probably like films out of Norway. Or... Well, and all of it, all of it was um, from what I remember, it was like sci-fi and horror stuff. So it wasn't necessarily going to be like modern day stuff here. The horror aspect would have actually, in a lot of cases, if, if this was a horror director, then yeah, we should have gotten CG ghosts because he would have known how to do it. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's okay to below average for me. Mm-hmm. Like if you're, if your brand's making new, it's okay. If you're not, it's, it's below average. Uh, and then finally, to wrap things up, how much money would you encourage people to spend on this? Rent it. Just see it on Netflix or Redbox it. I, I see. We we saw this fairly thrifty. I would say go see it thrifty. Like if you're a fan of Tomb Raider and you still want to go see this just for the hell of it, just go see it as cheaply as, as you could possibly do so. And if you can wait, just wait until it hits the, the streaming services at the very least and make sure that you want it before you get the Blu-ray kind of thing, because Look, as a diehard fan of Tomb Raider, either you're going to love this because, you know, you, maybe you don't like the Himiko storyline or you're going to hate it because it's it doesn't use its elements properly. 